next collections, the next governor and the next legislature will have almost $3 billion more to spend, so it'll be closer to $33 billion. We put out a budget that balances all areas of uh, the state's budget within okay. the amount it but has to spend. But you need revenue. Where do you get revenue? Uh, I'm sorry, the, the projection collections are going to be about 7 to 8% greater in the next biennium than they are right now. Because you won't be increasing any spending? Uh, we are increasing spending in certain areas. For instance, in health and human services, we've got about $650 billion or million dollars more than the state's current commitment uh, in this biennium. So some areas have been increased slightly and some areas have been decreased. But again, at this point, government has to live within its means. Uh, you can't consistently talk about growing government when what you're saying, you talk about more revenues. Uh, let's be honest. What we're talking about is uh, where are you going to raise taxes, Senator? Uh, where are you going to raise taxes, Mr. Horner? You're talking about $2.15 in new taxes in Mr. Horner's proposal. You're talking about uh, billions in uh, Senator Dayton's proposal. What we've done is we've produced a budget that does not raise taxes at a time where Minnesotans simply can't afford to pay more taxes. And you know, more importantly, we've shown where our numbers are. Neither of these gentlemen, it, all they talk about is what they will protect, but not what they're going to cut. And I think it's time that we see those so people can get a good idea from all three. Can you cut more? Can you shift more? cut more or shift more? Yeah. Mary, I've produced a balanced budget within the projected uh, amounts the government is going to have. Government will be able to live within its means under an Emmer administration. So there will be no shifts? No uh, you do shifts? not have to shift. You don't have to shift based on the budget we've given you. Okay. Tom Horner, take this one. Revenues, cuts, shifts? Sure. I mean, and, and, and I think it starts with an honest approach to, to the budget. I think we have to be transparent. I think we have to say to all Minnesotans that we do have a $6 billion shortfall left to us by Democrats and Republicans who, much like my, my colleagues here, approach the budget as a math problem to say, if we can make the numbers add up at the state level, then we're done with our job. And I don't believe that's the case. I think that when you have a budget that says we're just going to transfer costs to hospitals, to nursing homes, to assisted living facilities, to community-based services, that's not an honest budget. And the reality is that you look around Minnesota and 28% of, of care facilities, many of them in rural Minnesotas, many of them attached to, to rural hospitals, are in financial peril. They're on the, 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 the verge of and clothing. And we will dive into that and, more. And, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we but how need... about your budget and revenue sources? So my Tell budget, us about your exactly revenue right, Mary. I mean, my budget does have new revenue because we're being left with a $6 billion shortfall. And simply to say that we can do it on the basis of what we did last year is to say that the GAMC program, the, the, the program that provides health care for the lowest income and most vulnerable Minnesotans, is working. Because that's exactly what the kind of budget you're proposing for next year did to Minnesota and to hospitals and to nursing you homes have, this year. And so I do have cuts, revenue. Cuts, right. Cuts, so cuts, I yes. would right. So I would reform taxes by by um, cutting uh, taxes on on uh, the kinds of activities that discourage businesses from growing. So let's put money into allowing businesses to invest in research, development, new technologies, not to add to the bottom line, but to invest in those kinds of activities that specifically grow jobs then we have to pay for it. And so I would lower the rate on the sales tax by 1% and then expand it, not to business to business services, not to essential services like health care, okay. medical services, but to expand it and give everybody a stake in a more efficient government. Let's talk about an issue that this crowd has a stake in, health and human services. Senator Dayton, you mentioned 30% of the budget. Seen as you know, a weak economy drives more people into these state-run programs like Medicaid and federal programs. How will you approach, Representative Emmer, possible cuts to health and human services? Is well, there anything that should not be cut that would be off limits within health and human services in your budget? Well, it, this again is where we have been very clear, Mary. We we put. We've not only uh, held the current state commitment to health and human services where it's at, but we're increasing it by $650 million in the next biennium. And we have said government not only has to live within its means, but it's got to fund its priorities. And when we talk about health and human services, we're talking about children, we're talking about vulnerable adults, we're talking about our seniors, our nursing homes. Those are where our priorities are.
So it's a priority that will not be cut in nursing homes and seniors won't get cut? Again, that's, uh, if, if I were governor, it, it needs to be said this way, if I, I were governor, that would be the, those would be the priorities that should not be cut. But we have put a specific number on the table and understand that you have to work within the legislative process. So once we get back, if we are in the governor's office, we'll be working with uh, the Senate and with the House as to those details within that budget. Again, we've produced all in every area, Mary, what government can do and, and live within. It's got to fund its priorities. Uh, it would be interesting to hear where these gentlemen are going to cut. You know, Tom Horner talks about cutting almost $2 billion, but he hasn't made it clear where, and it's the same thing with Senator Dayton. I think people deserve to know all of the areas that these gentlemen are talking about trying to live within as well. Okay, let's dive into $2 billion of cuts, is that right? And where is it going to come from? Sure. I mean, it, 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 we are going to have to make cuts, and that's not true, Representative Emmer, and you know that. I mean, I have made very specific proposals on how we're going to cut the budget. We are going to start to transition away from some of the subsidy programs that aren't working very effectively. Ethanol, Job Z, programs that really don't create new opportunity, don't create new jobs, simply transfer jobs. How about I've health talked and about very program. specifically how to better deliver human services through the counties and, and a, a program that I have laid out that can save four to five hundred million dollars while increasing the quality of the services and increasing the accountability of the, the services. So I have been very clear. But I've also been very clear to say, look, you can't just pretend that all of the folks who are delivering human services in hospitals, in the facilities, in community-based services are going to be able to deliver the same quality of service at the same price that they did last year. Because the fact is, everybody has costs that are going up, costs that they can't control, insurance costs, energy costs, facility costs, and it is causing a problem. We do have 28% of nursing homes that are in financial peril. We do have reimbursement systems that aren't What's paying hospitals limits? even even their cost. What's off limits for cuts then? Our nursing home reimbursement rates are those I've off put limits in new for money. cuts? I've put in new money for older adult services because I think what we need to do, Mary, is not just say this is a math problem. It's not just a matter of making the numbers add up. We have to start making a transition to a better kind of service. We have to invest in, in how we're going to deliver services more effectively, okay. more efficiently as our population gets older. Okay, Senator Dayton, on health and human services, anything <laughs> off limits for cuts, how are you going to deal with increased enrollment too in this economy? Well, Representative Emmer says that uh, off limits, and I would agree, should be uh, older Americans, uh, the older Minnesotans, those with disabilities. That's uh, three-fourths of the medical assistance payments right there. And then we have just learned that now one-fourth of Minnesota's children are on, on being served by Medicaid. So if you take children, uh, older Minnesotans, and uh, those with disabilities, I mean, you're probably talking about 90% or more of, of the, uh, the public expenditures on their medical system, which is one of the reasons that the early opt-in for the federal medi medical, Medicaid funding is just crucial, especially and when we, we see now that, that those, yep. right, that we've yep. seen the rolls have gone up by 50,000. Uh, you know, we have a crisis in health care financing in this state and this country. I would agree with Mr. Horner in, uh, in a particular of a redesigned team, if I'm elected governor, that I would assemble right after the election and, and look at the, how we're going to finance health care. Because, it's, you know, it's, 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 it is the government side of things that is growing, and one of the, the driving forces of that is the, cost of, the rising cost of private health insurance and the number of people that cannot afford health insurance, so they go to the public side, or their employers are no longer making okay. private health insurance available, so they're being forced to the public side. So it's, it's you know, it's, it oversimplifies and understates the scope of the, of the real issue. It, it's a much more holistic approach we need to take we'll, as a society. We'll dive into that. What's so off how are we going to pay for health care? Well, limits? I would agree that older, uh, older Minnesotans, Does that mean nursing those homes, with disabilities, yes. I mean, reimbursement, you know, off limits for cuts. We've driven nursing homes into bankruptcy in the state. We're losing nursing homes that we have. The, we're underpaying the ones that are are still functioning and putting them in financial peril and you know again we're, we're not re-examining how we're paying for all these services so we're just okay. continuing to force people into underpayments and bankruptcy okay we're gonna transition into hospitals but I want to talk about health care real briefly and ask one of those surprise personal questions that I love to do we should all get physicals every year shouldn't we who's had their physical and gone to their doctor in the last year here within the last 12 months I have Emmer I don't, uh, what, what did you ask me last Friday night? <laughs> if you had a living will, which and was I, no. And I said no. Did you get I, a physical? I don't have a living will. I told her I got to take it one day at a time. I, 
have I have I had a physical? Uh, no, I haven't had one in the last. Uh, I mean, if you're talking from a qualified physician, no. Okay. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Dayton, have you had your physical? You take that any way you want. <laughs> <laughs> I will cede my time to Mr. Horner to explore that, uh, for Mr. Emmer to explore that further. <laughs> um, I, I felt this. like I've been having a physical for a while. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Uh, Can you thanks. Thanks, I have had my physical in the last year. Thank you for asking. You, you've been dying to ask me a question, too, right oh, back. It is fair. your parents. So. Thank you. Yes, the, my parents are proud to hear that. An issue that's been in the news, the National Nurses Union and the Minnesota Nurses Association has been advocating for mandated ratios of numbers of patients each nurse can care for. If Minnesota did so, it would be the second state following California to do this. Tom Horner, as governor, if you were presented with a bill from the legislature mandating nurse to patient ratios, would you sign it? Well, and, and I always try to avoid saying I would sign this bill or veto this bill. So let me say in general, that I think that is an issue that is best decided by hospitals and their nurses based on their own population, their own communities, and how they know best to care for their, their patients. I think the evidence... That sounds like a no, because you don't have a maybe, it, Ken. Well, I, I, I'm, and I am trying to be very clear to say that um, as, as a matter of principle, I don't think the state should be mandating staffing levels. Now, you know, if a bill came in that did something else maybe, but no, I mean, the state should not be mandating staffing levels because the evidence is very clear in California where it has been tried that it has not improved quality of care. It has driven up costs and, and there's compelling evidence. You know, we have to be thoughtful about making sure that hospitals are able to adapt. And the reality is that with different kinds of care teams, with different kinds of technology, hospitals more than anything else need flexibility in how they use their personnel. And so you look at Minnesota hospitals from border to border and we have the highest quality, the best okay. delivery of care in all of our hospitals okay, let's and move part on of it one. is because yeah. of the flexibility. Okay. Senator Dayton, would you sign? Yeah. Yep. Hospitals are happy to hear that. Would you sign a bill mandating nurse to patient well, ratios? I, I don't give yes or no answers to complex questions and as you know since you know the process, Mary, you know, no governor waits passively to just get a bill on his or her desk and then sign or veto. You, you negotiate in that process. I, I echo what Mr. Horner said. I volunteered uh, three summers at the old Abbott Hospital, and, you know, I've been a consumer of health, hospital services myself, and uh, one of my young interns was recently uh, in a car accident hit by a drunk driver and was in two weeks of intensive care at the Regents Hospital. I mean, our hospitals in this state are superb. They're one of the great resources we have here. Brainerd and Bemidji North, these are medical centers for North Central Minnesota. Uh, I also have great respect for nurses. I made a sign that said, you know, doctors are important, nurses are essential. And when my uh, un intern was in Regions for 24-hour 20 uh, intensive care, she had a one-on-one -on -one nursing ratio. Uh, and that was necessary, okay. called for. I assume the hospital and the nurses agreed on that. So, so I'd like to see okay. them negotiate okay. and work out. I have a, put a lot of faith and trust in nurses. I think people do, and in doctors, and in hospital administrators. Let's negotiate something that's in the, the best interest, that allows some flexibility, and also recognizes that nurses are saying if we can't provide the quality care that we know we must in, to our patients, that they, they're in a position to know that is better, if not better so than So you won't else. say yes or no to I'll a bill? I'll say I'll negotiate. Okay. Representative Emmer, yes or no on yeah. a bill mandating? Mary, first, uh, based on the information that we have from California and studies all across the country, as a matter of fact, that show that, in fact, it does not uh, improve quality of care and it drives up cost, I would never expect the legislature to pass such a bill. But if it did somehow happen, the answer would be no, I would not uh, sign that. Not sign it. Very good. Let's move on to the next issue. <clears throat> Minnesota's uninsured rate, along with the rest of the nation, has been climbing. One in ten Minnesotans lack health insurance, and employer-provided coverage, as we know, is plummeting across the country and right here in Minnesota. So, Senator Dayton, you get this one first. How would you ensure more Minnesotans get insurance? Well, this would be part of this whole reexamination, and your, your point is, you know, it just came out, Minnesota's rate has gone up, and we have one of the lowest rates of uninsured in the country because the, you know, governor and the legislature, unfortunately the governor reversed that with GMC, but there has been a recognition, and my running mate, Yvonne Pretner solon has been instrumental in the Minnesota Senate in, in expanding the, through GMC, through Minnesota Care, some of the alternatives to leaving people uninsured, because we know that the uninsured go to emergency rooms and, 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 and out of necessity, 
which is far more expensive than neighborhood clinics or the other kinds of appropriate would medical care. Would more people care. have so insurance under a it, Dayton administration? Well, that would be the goal, absolutely. Yeah. We need to have affordable, accessible health care for all of our citizens. And because we know that if they don't have affordable and accessible care, they go somewhere where they get more expensive care at everybody else's expense. That's what, part of what drives up insurance. This is a circular issue here that we as a society you know, really need to get on top of because you know, we have an aging population, which we do, and we have greater capacity to provide medical care, which is a wonderful part of our modern life. These cost factors are driving. Health care is now 17% of our GDP nationally. And we have got to rationalize and reform, and, 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 but it's got to be part of a whole approach. Because if, if the private sector, which in the past, employers provided health insurance, it was affordable, that system is unraveling. More and more people are going to these public needs, or they're going somewhere where they're just going to get served. Okay. So we have to get this as a holistic approach and not just say, well, government, you've got only one piece of it. It's all part of the same. Okay, Representative Emmer, will more people have insurance under your administration? Fewer people? It's going away from employers. Yeah, Should government provide it? Do you want everybody just in the private marketplace? Yeah, I, I would prefer that, but there is a place for government and health care, obviously. What's the place? There, there, were three, there would be three things that I would uh, say about this. First, there's a lot of uncertainty right now because of what's happening in Washington. We don't know what the status is going to be. There's an election on the horizon. There's been a commitment, commitment by uh, w one party that they're not going to support the federal health care legislation, creating a lot of uncertainty at the state level. Uh, that being said, uh, if we are uh, elected governor of the state of Minnesota, what uh, we will be working with the legislature on is, first off, trying to create more accessibility by creating more of a marketplace that will drive down costs. So more people will be insured? Will, two things I'm going to say about it, uh, Mary. First, I think you've got to decouple health care insurance from employment. You've got to give individuals the same opportunity to deduct their health care insurance premiums that we right now give to employers. Second, you've got to give people more of an opportunity to pool with uh, other individuals, and you've got to give them an opportunity to make choices not only about who provides their health care insurance by shopping across state lines, but how they design the health care coverage that they have. That will start to drive down costs, and then if you really want to address all these problems, you got to start growing jobs in the state of Minnesota again. You got to give people the opportunity to make a quality living, and that is what in turn Let me drives back up. not only will the that programs, insure more people? Absolutely. Okay. If if they if they have well. a good job, they can not only put food on the table, clothes on their kids, and pay their mortgage, but they can afford the great health care that we have to offer in the state of Minnesota. Okay, Tom Horner, how well, do you so deal with the fewer people being insured and getting them? Insured? So let me start with the answer to your question, Thank and then you. I'll do the explanation. Thank you. And the answer is. <laughs> Absolutely. In 2014, there will be more Minnesotans insured than there are today if I'm governor. Okay. And how do and you I'll pay for it? And I'll tell you how. Yeah. And, and, and it is an area where there is such a clear difference among the three of us. It is not simply by adding more government, and it is not simply by turning away from government. The reality is that in Minnesota, we've had a terrific private-public partnership. And I understand, as somebody who purchased insurance for my employees when I had the company, I understand the challenges of being a small employer going out into the marketplace. And it's not just having more insurance companies to shop from. That's not what's going to do, drive down costs. We have to make structural reforms. We have to do the kinds of things that we already have a good start on in Minnesota, like coordinating care for those with chronic illnesses, like making sure that we're paying for quality, not just outcomes. But a lot of those kinds of things, Mary, are going to take an investment up front. We have to spend money to reform the system to make a transition to a better system. And you don't do that if you just say, government, go away. And you don't do it if you just say, dump more money into the existing programs. And so I understand, as a small employer, what happened when government comes along and says, well, we're going to require insurance companies to cover this, this, and this. My company pays for it. I understand what happens when you say to, to government, we're going to eliminate programs for the low income. We're going to take GAMC, again, the program for the lowest income, and dump them on rural hospitals. Do you Eventually, want to I pay okay. for it. Okay. And so here's what I'm going to do is I will put money aside, have money in my budget, to do the early opt-in to Medicaid. I think we have okay. to get more people covered in order to have reform but then you have to build on it from there. You have to use the state's purchasing power as the biggest purchaser of health insurance, of health coverage in Minnesota, to make redesigns in the system, to buy better, 
to, to create a different kind of marketplace, not just with more insurance companies. How about, should people be able to shop over state lines, like Representative Emmer said? Do you want that? It's, Open it's it up to It's not a solution. Profits. It's not a okay. solution. No. I mean, it's it's political okay. rhetoric. It okay. hasn't. It it it. You don't shop for health care in the same way that you shop for auto insurance. Okay. In auto insurance, you can get out your book and say, Dented Fenter, if you're in Minnesota or Illinois okay. or Mississippi, here's the cost. Okay, you I have a heart problem, you don't take out a blue book and say, here's the cost of it. You go to a okay. good hospital and I get examined personally, and that's what we need. You mentioned federal health care reform. Both of you have done that. That's in the news right now, too, as some of the provisions start to take effect. Representative Emmer, is there any scenario where you would opt in you know, Medicaid is a program that's been around for almost half a century. Democrats and Republicans liked it, created it. Is there any scenario where the chamber comes to you, hospital association, where they come to you and, and plead their case and you would opt in? Well, I think you always have to say you'll listen. Uh, but you just named uh, special interests as opposed to what's good for all of Minnesota. And, uh, you know, I know that there are a lot of folks from hospitals out here that are looking at this uh, potential uh, early opt-in money as the solution. Uh, what I just heard from my colleague next to me is, you know, we should continue down the road where our providers and our, our uh, hospitals are getting reimbursed at lower than cost rates. We should be uh, reimbursing at 10 cents on the dollar, 20 cents on the dollar, 30 cents on the dollar. Mary, that is the wrong answer for the future. It's not just that based on the early opt-in right now. But hospitals were cut in if, anticipation of this opt-in. If, if we can talk about uh, the federal program and the, the play, what my position has been all along is great. We do the early opt-in and then are we here in two years? Are we here in two years because the federal government is saying, here's your IOUs. We talk about investing more money in health care, but uh, you know, here's another IOU. Let's talk about fixing this for the long term. Let's start talking about, at a state level, not just pumping more money into it. Let's talk about the maintenance of effort requirements that come with the okay, federal money. Okay, you do some of these state reforms, then would you possibly be open I, to I taking you, some federal money? I think money? you always have to look at what the federal money is that's being offered and what it obligates us to in the long term. You never say no. Uh, out of the gate, you always evaluate it based. You got a fiduciary. So you're not saying no out of the gate. I am to the early opt-in. Yeah. I have, and I always will, because based on I know what I know right now, it's 430 million dollars over the three, first three years. Uh, it absolutely reimburses in uh, against what Minnesota prides itself on. Our system is uh, it innovates. Why? Because we figured out how to provide okay. high quality at low cost. The federal reimbursement is based on volume of care. These are not the answers for the future of Minnesota. Besides, again, once we get to 2014, Mary, and I, I don't know that anybody's talking about it, 11 states were given the right to do the early opt-in. Two have elected it. Only one has gotten it. As far as I know, they still don't have their money. we got to talk about long-term solutions instead of waiting for whatever it is we can get from the federal okay. government and then hoping that it carries us for a year Senator or two. Dayton, you came from the federal government as a U.S. Senator. The Fed money's been kind of vilified. Is there a bad repercussion? Does it tie the state's hands? Is the money really going to come through? Is well, it worth the, it to the, opt in? In the near, yes, because in the near term, in the next three years, uh, that means uh, $3.7 million of additional funding for St. Joseph's Hospital in Brainerd, almost $6 million for the hospital in Bemidji. And, and these hospitals, uh, especially in greater Minnesota, have been pre pressed to the brink of, of financial insolvency, and that affects their ability to provide quality health care for all Minnesotans. Uh, and, and they're also some of the mainstays of, of greater Minnesota's uh, economy. You know, we disagreed with this before, Representative Emmer and I went back and I looked at the letter that the head of the Minnesota Hospital Association and the Medical, Minnesota Medical Association wrote urging Governor Plenty to sign the early opt-in and said the net cost to the state is $188 million. That is in the budget projection for the next biennium. The money's in there, $188 million for $1.4 billion in federal money. And, you know, I also want to point out, you know, they just came out yesterday with the announcement of this, you know, federal health care and the mandates. And I looked at them and I thought, you know, here they're requiring uh, coverage for children under parents' uh, policies for up to age 26. Young people graduating from college these days, looking for jobs, are not going to be covered up till age 26 under their parents' health care policies, so they get health care. No copays for mammograms and colonoscopies, which we know are extremely important in preventing more costly uh, health problems in the future. Uh, 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 prohibiting insurance companies from uh, uh, 
uh, exempt, uh, from failing to cover children because of pre-existing conditions. Okay. Lifting the lifetime limit on what a health insurer will provide for somebody who has insurance and has higher medical costs. Who, I mean, I'd like to know if anybody disagrees okay, how about that those are not good, anybody disagree? common sense, <laughs> consumer protection measures and cost saving measures. Anybody disagree? It's, yep. it's, you know, with all due respect, that's politicians again talking about, isn't this great? We're going to provide all of this, and uh, we all agree that it would be wonderful if we could, but are we writing checks that can never be cashed? Are we writing IOUs again that we cannot honor? That's what we're talking about here. We, what about we that all, preventative we, care, though, not denial of pre-existing conditions? Do you like those concepts? Guaranteed issue we should absolutely uh, support and we should have, but it's the wrong approach when we're going to say government can solve all these problems. We need to start talking at a state level how we make sure that our hospitals can get credit for the uncompensated care that the law requires them to provide. Rather than partnering up with a program that says you're going to get reimbursed at a, uh, an amount that's actually below what it costs you to provide the care that you want okay, to provide. Okay. Quick last word on this. Well, these are complicated issues. And, and again, I think that the, the real solution isn't to argue about whether we have more government or less government. It is to have a discussion around how we keep building on what hospitals, nursing homes, providers, health systems already are doing in Minnesota. How do we provide better care at lower cost? And some of that is going to take an investment up front so that we can save costs long term. That's been our challenge in Minnesota is that for the last many years, when Representative Emmer has been in the legislature, the approach has been shift the cost. Shift the cost to, to employers who are buying insurance, to individuals, to property taxpayers, and mostly to providers. And a budget that says no growth or a budget that says let's put in a lot of tax dollars is not a budget that's going to do true reform. We need true okay. reform. We have to be honest to say that if we're going to have a robust health care market, if we're going to have a strong <laughs> rural community, a strong rural economy that has a health care infrastructure, we better be willing to make investments right now so that we can have that long-term good care, quality care, affordable care. You mentioned long-term care. Long-term care is what we're going to turn to now. And we're going to transition on another question about you and your personal lives. I think it's the last one, by the way. <laughs> we'll start with you, Tom Horner. Do you have long-term care insurance? No. Emmer, long-term care insurance? No, I don't have a living will. I haven't had a physical. And no, <laughs> at this point, I don't have long-term care insurance. And again, you want to be governor. <laughs> Senator Dayton. I do have a living will. I have had a physical and I do not have long-term insurance. Okay, very good. Speaking of long-term care, this is a type of care that's extremely labor intensive. Census estimates that by 2030, Minnesota's elder population will increase by over 100%. In that same time, caregiving workforce is only set to increase by about 5%. So that's a big gap. Again, this is a workforce that makes around $11 an hour right now. So what policies do you have to recruit, retain qualified, dedicated caregivers for this booming population? Tom Horner. Well, I think, first of all, you have to change the environment in which care is provided by creating more options, more opportunities. Um, and, and so that means that we have to look at how do we make sure that, that people have the opportunity to age in place. And so there are some great programs around the, the state in, in Steele County, Healthy Seniors uses a little bit of federal money, a little bit of state money to build a consortium of, of nonprofit agencies that help people age in place, stay in their own and homes. And how does that help the workforce issue? Well, be, yeah. be, because if, if we have fewer people who are in the, the, the facilities, we can put more money into staffing. We can put more money into care. You know, I don't think, again, I don't think it's realistic to say that given the aging population, given the, the demands that we all have, that we're going to be spending less money. In real terms, we are going to be spending more money. The challenge is how do we spend it better? And I think we do have an opportunity if we can find areas of efficiency where we can help people live independently for as long as possible, have a community-based system, if we can deal with chronic care, then with those people who, who do need um, some institutional help, whether it's assisted living, whether it's, it's um, a, a nursing home, then we have the resources where we can invest in quality care, including invest in the, the personnel. 
Okay, Representative Ember, how about that personnel? We have boomers aging and looks like the workforce is not going to be there to provide care. Well, I, that's, you're, you're actually talking about two different things. One, you're talking about uh, funding the workforce right. so you make it attractive. Uh, second, I thought I just heard you said just the numbers themselves. We aren't generating enough people to fill these slots in the future. I think uh, first when you talk about funding, I, I said it earlier, you have to fund your priorities. Uh, this should be one of our priorities. And, Contrary to what uh, my colleague says, I voted for increasing the, uh, the reimbursements to these uh, uh, great people in my time in the legislature. Again, you got to fund your priorities. You also got to be honest about your budget. When you, tell, when you try to be everything to everybody and you tell them I produce this great budget and we're going to fund uh, K-12 education, we're going to fund health and human services, we're going to hold the line here, you got to start telling people where you're going to make up the $2 billion you're missing or the 2 or $3 billion that you're missing. Uh, here's what it, the ultimate solution to all of our problems is. One, government has to live within its means. Two, you've got to fund your priorities. We're not putting people out on the street. Three, you've got to start generating new jobs so that you can okay. grow and tax collections and pay for And how do you generate jobs in that workforce? As a group of people makes about 11 bucks an hour. What do you do to recruit, retain them? I, I tell you, I just did. You drop okay. taxes and you grow jobs in the private sector and you fund your priorities. The more that you generate, the more the opportunity and to make investments And that's going to bring people into long-term care. About. I think there work. are a lot of people who are looking for opportunities right now. But where we're at with our long-term care, the system is not supporting those opportunities the way it should. You need to focus on your priorities, and I've already said, our seniors should be one of our priorities. Okay. And keeping in mind that many of these facilities are not for profit, the tax reductions might not be quite as impactful as they are in other industries. Well, so you have to don't. talk about other ways of doing exactly, it. Exactly, which that is dialogue. exactly what I'm talking about well, actually, in realistic you terms. You haven't, Tom. You've got to talk about what you're actually going to do to these different organizations. You've got to talk about where is that other $2 billion, that, where are you going to cut it? I mean, what, where are the draconian cuts going to come from? Uh, and your, your numbers don't add up. You are going to be taxing health services. You're going to be taxing no, people's not. walkers. You have to in order to get to $2.15 billion. You've got to be honest about that. I story. am honest about it, Representative. I started with Department of Revenue data. Are you going to be I taxing walkers? No, we're not going to tax. <laughs> I may ask Representative Emmer. I may I, I may ask Representative Emmer to kick in a few dollars eventually for his. But no, I mean I've said very I've clearly. Been, I've been kicking in a lot. I, I've said very clearly we're going to take medical services off the table. We won't tax those. We won't tax prescription drugs, medical devices, and the numbers do add up. And the department, the don't. Department of Revenue said they did. They have not. And you, you have be better. Honest about that. You have. Well, I am honest about it. No, it hasn't been done. Okay, Senator well, Dayton, do well, you well, know? Marion, let me just finish Very this. quickly, so, so we do want to get some. Well, no, I'm just curious yeah. as to where is your information that the Department of Revenue has said my numbers don't add up because the Department of Revenue told me that the numbers do add up. Well, put it out there. We have, I have we, put we, it out asked, there. and we have not been given anything that supports well, that. In fact, uh, what we Tom, have been shown not true. Okay. Have no, been that's shown not true. is that okay. you have to make a much broader attempt. Senator you know, Dayton, do your numbers add up now? Okay. 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 Gentlemen, Reverend, let's... Reverend, Senator Dayton. I'm going back to your question. Yes. Your question about the health care. We'll, we'll get there, but how about we're on this fun tangent of numbers not adding up and your budget was criticized for not adding up. If anybody here is tracking whose numbers don't add up to what, I would be surprised. Let me go back to the question. You know, because I, I, I acknowledge Representative Emmer has specified where he's going to make draconian cuts, 21% cut in health and human services. And you talked about the fact that people need to get paid $11 an hour and uh, hopefully also have health care benefits themselves and have job stability. And that's one of the, again, key factors in the early Medicaid opt-in. $1.4 billion has been estimated by Families USA would mean 29,000 jobs added or saved in the health care sector of, of Minnesota. It's crucial. So, because this is a people-intensive business. Okay. And, and if you have and, to find so, a billion say, more, though, in your that, budget. So, more people, more people are going to cost more money, more mm -hmm. people needing care. Now, what, what we are doing in Minnesota, and we need to, to add to this, is, is the elderly waiver program. Minnesota is one of the leaders in that, in providing an alternative. Are you peeking at my notes? Care. Because no, I'll not. get I'm there. Just, uh, no, I, pro I promise. Well, <laughs> you have the advantage of the notes, so I don't know what's next. But let me get, you know, focus on because some I'll of let you get there, but right. I'll, I'll right. promise I'll let you get to elderly waiver because really I think you could have been peeking. They're, they're next. <laughs> 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 
that physical must have been helping your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> you had. Uh, how about your budget, though? Are you going to have to cut into elderly services cut, workforce? I've not cut in my budget. I've accepted the projections. But your the, new budget, people have criticized, budget, is still one. being a billion short. Is it's it a billion short? It's million short. And, okay. you know, it's a work in process. I mean, I, you know, I look for additional cuts. The fallback position, as I said, which these two gentlemen have adopted, is to not repay the school shift, the $1.4 billion on the books. So if I had to, you know, in worst case scenario, it's $890 million that I'm short, you know, repay the $510 million in the uh, shift and delay the other, I, I, that would be the worst case scenario. I don't want to do that. I think that money is owed to the schools. It, it, was, it was taken from them involuntarily by the governor uh, in the last uh, go round, and that money's owed back. We had to square our fiscal okay. accounts at the state level rather than putting the burden on local governments, and as Mr. Horner okay. said correctly, on uh, health care providers. Okay, Mr. X ray Vision, elderly waiver is the next topic, and it is a program funded by state <laughs> um, and federal dollars. <laughs> That allows older adults who would otherwise be in a nursing home choose to be where they want to get that service. That can be in their home, assisted living. It is seen to be more cost effective. So tell us, how do you protect consumer choice when this waiver program has been cut in the last two legislative sessions? Well, that's the problem. I mean, again, we're, we're, we're you know, penny wise and pound foolish if we're not supporting those that are showing a better alternative. Now, Minnesota, again, we should take credit for what the, as the initiatives that you and others in this audience have taken. In, in looking for lower cost alternatives. It's about $2,200 a year less to provide an elderly waiver in home service, and many elderly would, who would like to stay in their home should be supported in doing so. That benefits them, it benefits uh, the larger community. Okay, so no so, more cuts to elderly waivers? Well, no, because again, we, we're, you know, we're, we're cutting off our nose to spite our face. We're forcing the seniors. Same thing with, uh, with Plenty's cutting the renter uh, t credit. Uh, the same thing with raising property taxes as have happened under you know, Governor Plenty's so-called no new taxes mantra. Property taxes are going from $4 billion to $7 billion statewide. That impacts seniors who are limited fixed incomes and their ability to stay in their home. Cutting elderly waivers means that they don't have the support services to stay in their home, stay in their apartment, and force people into more costly other forms of care. So, you know, I mean, again, if, you, we, 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 if we just take a, a meat axe to one aspect of this uh, un, unthinkingly, we're just going to add costs on other sides of the equation. Okay, Representative Emmer, you were lucky to be a part of that legislature that had to make cuts to elderly waivers. Would you continue to do that? Mary, as I've already said, I'm the only one that's put out a complete and balanced budget within the uh, anticipated dollars that the state's going to have. Uh, it's, it includes a $650 million increase in health and human services. We'll work through the legislative process if we are in the, in the uh, governor's office. And the uh, Senate and the House and the executive branch will all work on what that's going to look what like. What about but that concept, though, of being able to fund people I, staying you in gotta, their homes, you more fund consumer your priorities. choice? That should be one of our priorities. But again, you got to go back to this, uh, you know, the argument that somehow government should be allowed to expand uh, no matter what our economic situation is. Uh, it, it just isn't the right approach. I don't know how many people realize that the general fund spending in this state from 2001 to the end of this biennium 2011 will have grown by $6.5 billion. Uh, what these two gentlemen are suggesting that in just the next two years, and I will say it again without providing details, these two gentlemen are suggesting that in the next two years, the general fund spending should go up by almost $8 billion. So $6.5 billion in 10 years and almost $8 billion in the next two years. It's simply not sustainable. We have put out a budget that maintains our state's commitment, and now we've got to fund our priorities, and this would be Is one. Is that true? Are you two looking at $8 billion increases? Can I just point out, yes. You know, you point the finger, Representative Emmer, at government, as though government's creating these uh, enterprises for its own benefit. It's for the benefit of people. When 50,000 people in Minnesota have gone from private insurance or no insurance to these uh, public systems, GMC or, or MA, in the last year, I mean, that, that government is then the repository of the failure of our, and we agree, job creation, but healthcare costs are one of the major impediments to job creation. So when the, when the private employers are not insuring, when people lose their insurance, as you said, because they lose their jobs, and then they go to public assistance, which 
the point being made, if they didn't do that, they would be going uninsured to hospitals, emergency rooms, which would be even more costly for all the rest of us. You know, this is just not a matter of government trying to increase its budget to expand its wasteland. This is about real people, real crisis situations, and, and people desperate and turning to whatever they can to get the health care that, you know, ought to be a basic right in this society given all of our resources. Do we need to find out how to do it better? Absolutely, Mr. Hearn. I agree with you entirely. We need to take a look at how we reform our whole health care financing because this is going to be an expanding problem. People are getting older. I mean, more people in the elderly waiver programs, they're not just, you know, appearing because they're 15 years old. It's because they're 65, 75, 95 years old. Same thing with nursing homes. The pressure is there. Let's, okay. let's say that these are real problems that are not subject to, you know, rhetoric and just, you know, finger pointing, these are about helping people okay. live out the rest of their lives with dignity and respect. Okay. Let me help other people get cost. in on this issue. Well, and I'm, I'm always pleased that Representative Emmer knows my budget better than I do, um, and, and so I should allow him to talk about it. The fact is that the numbers have been validated by the Department of Revenue, and I think Representative Emmer knows that. Secondly, that when you look at the $6 billion shortfall, you know, about half of it, roughly, is due directly to the, the decisions that Representative Emmer, Democrats, Republicans, made in this past legislative session just to kick the problems down the road. I mean, we've got to cover $2 billion that came in from federal money to, to, to fund, uh, with one-time money, ongoing operations. That has to either be real cuts or we've got to figure out how to, to pay it. The same thing with the school shifts. That's the reality. And so to pretend that we can just tax a handful of people and everybody else in Minnesota gets a free ride or we can just punish the poor and everybody else gets a free ride I think is not the right approach. I think on programs like Elderly Waiver, Mary, it is exactly the kind of investment that we ought to be making for the future. Sounds like but, no cuts then but, to but Elderly Absolutely, waiver. but we okay. also need to be let's, investing in other areas. Okay, we need to make sure that we have areas. transitions yep. in other areas to get better value out of okay. every health care okay. dollar working with, with this community. Let's tackle one more question before we get to wrap-ups. There are multiple state and local agencies that potentially impact policy in Minnesota, including, here's just a small list, Board of Aging, Department of Human Services, Department of Health, 87 counties, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, Department of Commerce, we could go on and on. So providers say this can be troublesome. It can prevent coordination, create duplication, makes it difficult for consumers and companies to navigate. So, Representative Emmer, Aging Services of Minnesota has been working on this issue, and what do you want to do to better align these state functions? You've talked a lot about redesign, but what does that mean? Well, it, it means eliminating all of these excessive number of uh, windows that people have to go through in order to make things happen with government. And I, we've talked about Do some about of these it. go away completely? Well, they, they might. I mean, we need to be talking about the fact that we have 86 counties, and I think uh, last time I counted, 56 public health uh, agencies. Do we need 56 uh, public health uh, agencies? We, we've got to talk about looking at every single agency as it exists, where the over, overlapping jurisdiction is, where the overlapping authority is, and we need to streamline Did it. Did you cut Absolutely. a county, by the way? What's that? Did you cut a county? I thought I 87. said 87. Yeah. Oh, did Just I? Just wonder if that say, was one of the things you were going to cut in your budget. <laughs> Hey, there are some people who would say yes. Okay. But, I, you know, I, I also want to go back, Mary, to one other yes. thing. You know, Senator, I'm sorry if you took that as a uh, pointing at you. Uh, that's not what I was doing. The only direction I'm pointing is out in the future. And what you're suggesting, with all due respect, what you're both suggesting, you know, Tom, you point at the senator and say you just want to tax some, and you talk about I want to tax everybody. Here's the thing. That's all we've been doing in this state now for decades. And you can't just say raise more taxes and grow more government. It's not that government's a okay. bad thing. Okay. It's that we've got we to, re to redesign it, and we've got to make sure that we don't and, drive and any How more about jobs redesign, Senator Dayton? I'd like to hear on redesign well, and streamlining. The overlapping okay. jurisdictions, the duplication of reporting requirements, uh, the fact that hospitals have to deal with 12 different private insurers per day on average. I mean, all of this overlapping jurisdiction. If I could wave a magic wand and I will tackle this, so if I'm governor, step by step with my running mate, Devon Pretner Solon has already started the process, let's eliminate a lot of these duplications, okay. triplications. When I was in the Senate, I offered an amendment. You know, I was told by the Mayo Clinic that Medicare rules and regulations comprise 110 pages. 
Now, I took their word for it because I didn't have time to read them all myself. So I proposed an amendment saying that we had to reduce the number of words in the, by two-thirds with the idea being that if it can't be said in 37,000 pages, it doesn't need to be said. Okay. <laughs> and it was opposed, actually, by some of the interest groups, but it just underscores the okay. fact that these are, com again, complex. But yes, the answer is we've got to over reduce this okay. overlapping jurisdiction and the multiplication of reporting requirements. Last. Well, and of course we do. I mean, I would agree. But I'm the only one who's actually put out specific proposals in how to do it, how to redesign the delivery of human services through the counties. Is it controversial? Yes. Is it going to take a new kind of tax system? Yes. I mean, the problem, Representative Emmer, is also that we have a wrong tax system. We ta have a tax system creating for a manufacturing and natural resources-based economy as we're moving toward a service and knowledge economy, and we better change our tax system not just by adding to income taxes, but not by sticking our head in the sand and pretending that we can just continue the same path. We need to change the system. So along with the redesign, a very specific proposal that will take a lot of work, will take the investment of everybody, okay. but we'll get it done. We also need, though, to also give more trust, accountability, and responsibility to our partners in the private sector. Okay. including we ought to say to nursing homes we're going to give you flexible licensing so you can figure out how to make sure that the beds in your facilities are used for the most cost okay. efficient effective and purposes. And speaking of those nursing homes and hospitals we've been talking to a lot of folks here from those organizations and there are many undecided voters in this audience right now so make your final pitch they're on the fence they're not sure which you which person they want to vote for this is your final chance here tell them why you are the candidate for this crowd. Senator Dayton. Well, I want to thank all of you from uh, hospitals, nursing homes, and the health care providers in Minnesota. Uh, you're one of the greatest uh, resources that we have in our state. And as I said earlier, you know, work, working as, as a volunteer orderly in a hospital in Minneapolis years ago, and, and seeing the, the, the commitment of professionalism, doctors, and nurses, and, and the support staff, and, and all of you, I mean, you're one of the great uh, strengths the platinum jewels in our, our social uh, network in Minnesota. And when I was Commissioner of Economic Development, asked businesses, why are you locating, why are you expanding in our state? Always they said, well-educated, hardworking, productive citizens, and then one of the best quality healthcare systems in the world. Uh, I remember going to Amman, Jordan, when I was in the U.S. Senate and, and the meeting with the foreign minister there. He asked me where I was from, I said, uh, Minnesota. I said, do you know where Minnesota is? And he smiled and said, I spent uh, six months there three years ago. The Mayo Clinic uh, saved my father from cancer. You know, the, that's the reputation Minnesota has that we want to build upon. So I, th I thank you for what you're doing, and I'd say I know, as you do, that you know, the re political rhetoric aside, you're facing cost crises, financial crises, and the challenges of providing quality medical care and, and to an aging population and to a population where we can receive more services and we okay. need more services. And if I'm governor, I'll work with you, with you, on how to do that more effectively. Okay. Representative Emmer, why would you be the best governor for hospitals and nursing homes? Well, I would too, just echo, I'd like to say thank you, and I'd also like to say uh, out loud, it is an honor and a privilege to be up here and running for this office with these two gentlemen. We have differences, but I have a lot of respect for both. I will just tell you uh, that uh, if, if somebody tries to suggest that uh, the new way is raising taxes, that a new direction, regardless of the tax policy that we apply, the new direction is just raising taxes and allowing government to grow yet again without addressing the structural reforms that have to happen. That is not the new direction. That's the same direction that's applied by well-meaning people in this state for decades now. It's time to do it differently. It's time for government to live within its means and start to grow jobs because that's what will pay for what we need. And why would we, I believe, provide the best representation, the best service to your organizations? Because I'm not willing to say that we can just keep band-aiding what we're doing. We need to start talking about the reality, and this isn't rhetoric, the reality that our providers are taking reimbursements at well below the cost of providing the services. And we need to talk about, at a state level, how we can perhaps not only lead in Minnesota and in the region, but lead in the country in terms of talking about reforms that will allow you to get full reimbursement, at least credit for it, maybe not with dollars, but by being able to keep more of the revenues that you generate, more of the income you generate in providing the services. We need to talk about doing things differently and out of the box. Just because we've been doing them, Mary, this way for decades, well-meaning people in the early 70s th thought they could make health care in Minnesota better. You know what? We've realized, or we should have realized by now, we're headed in a direction that's just making it harder and harder to do your job. Let's start talking about 
the state taking a leadership role in helping you do not only do the job that you want to do, but get paid for it. Okay. Finally, Tom Horner. Well, and, and I think this debate has shown the clear differences. So thank you very much for bringing us together. Thanks to all of us, to all of my, my colleagues up here on, on the dais. Because I think it does show the, the differences and the way Minnesota has to go. And we won't solve our challenges. We won't meet the needs of, of next year and the year after and many years to come if we just limit our solutions to this ideology or that ideology. Because the fact is, we need to take good ideas, whether they're Republican or Democrat. And there are good ideas from all sides. We should incent private savings. We should incent the purchase of insurance. We should tell Minnesotans that you're going to have to take more personal responsibility for your health care, including your long-term care. And we need to do it. But we also need to say, as government, we will be partners with you in making a transition to a much more effective, efficient kind of system. And so you're right. We are going to have to get reimbursement up across the board. But we're not going to do it if we say that government is going to, to be held uh, to a, a level that isn't going to meet the demand. And we just have to be honest with that. Okay. So let me say this to you, is that I think the next four years will take bold leadership. It will take innovative leadership. And bold leadership in the next four years only starts with bold leadership from you, the voters, in November of this year. Okay. Thank you very much, candidates, you. our audience, and our debate sponsors. That's a wrap.